Tassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasahami Before uh, going into a bit more of a talk, <clears throat> thought I'd do a tiny guided meditation on Buddhanusati or recollection of the Buddha. And so you can close your eyes because this will be a an imaginative exercise. You don't have to close your eyes, no pressure, but. So in your mind's eye, just imagine you're at home and you're by yourself. It's just a normal morning, somewhat early in the morning. And you happen to look out the window onto the street and walking there on the sidewalk headed in the direction of your house is the Buddha. And you can see that he's a human. You've never met the Buddha before, but there's something about his bearing something about his brightness, the tranquility and grace with which he walks, the absolute firmness and rootedness of his steps, how it seems like he's not even moving. It's as if the whole world is moving around him but he's headed in the direction of your house. And what does he, what does he look like? He's a prince who's given up all of his princely attire and princely role and become a renunciant. He is wearing robes similar to those that monastics wear these days. Not that much different. And hopefully, if, you're, if you've come to Clear Mountain this morning, then you'd be all the more excited to see the actual Buddha not sure if he's actually going to stop at your house. You open the door and invite him in. And to your absolute joy, he, he does come in and you invite him to sit down. And what does it feel like? And where do you sit? And what does it sound like? I can imagine just an utter, almost negative soundscape. Where it seems like the whole world is just completely quiet. It's almost as if I can hear his breath and my own breath. But what is, what is this scene like for you in your own house? This is a living, the living Buddha. And what 
does it feel like? Are you the most excited you've been in your life? Are you the most afraid you've been in your life? Are you the most anticipatory and just most calm you've ever been in your life? Does he radiate a extremely palpable sense of well-being which just envelops you or is it is it none of these do you feel utterly normal this is just some person who's come into your house whatever the case you've been sitting there with him just you and he in your in your house your apartment and the silence has just been pristine or crystalline or whatever it's been for you but after a period of time shorter or longer you or he will say something. And what would that be? I can imagine myself just having tears roll down my face. Feelings of rapture and an upwelling of gratitude and warmth. But what, what is it for you? And whatever you say, what would he say? Or if he's the first to speak, what would he say? And what would his voice sound like in the canon? It's said that the Buddha had a utter grandeur to him, both in his physicality and in his voice. He had a deep voice, a resonant voice. It said that his voice would carry exactly the length of his practitioner so would reach just to where you are that he wouldn't need to speak any louder than is necessary and his voice was sweet like a Kulavinka bird and what would he say? And after this short, short dialogue, this short encounter, hopefully the most poignant and meaningful of your life, you can just both sit together in your own house, your own space. And you fully take in that the depth and profundity of this encounter. Hopefully it was deep and profound. And, but if it just feels totally normal, just someone came into your house, you have no relationship with the Buddha yet, just some historical figure to you or 
maybe you're not even sure, did the Buddha really exist? That's totally fine too. And after a period of time, the Buddha gets up and he leaves. And you walk him out and he continues on his way. your heart is just left reverberating. So please feel totally free to just stay in this heart space. If you if that's been a profound experience for you and uh, you're actually able to deeply imagine that and to feel as if, yeah, maybe in somehow even just visualizing that, imagining that took you to a, a stillness of heart, just rest there and stay in that heart space. Uh, I thought to bring this up because it... Uh, speaks to, um, yeah, what the Buddha said. So in the visualization, um, I'm hoping everyone before the Buddha got in, hopefully you were able to clean up your house a little bit, maybe, uh, you know, throw the potato chips behind the couch or, you know, throw the cans in the recycling or do whatever kind of, you wipe off the, you wipe off the counter, or whatever you have to do. Um, throw some stuff in the closet, uh, but just to be able to receive him well, this is a important encounter. Um, so, uh, people who are new to Clear Mountain might not know that we have uh, a Discord group. That's an online uh, chatting and communication, um, community building platform, and. We've got what's called an Upasaka group, a group of people who meet and uh, discuss suttas or the Buddha's discourses every two weeks. And this past Monday, we went through a discourse called the Upakilesa Sutta. This is the discourse on the corruptions, was the one translation. And it's a really wonderful occasion to read discourses together. And I find it, I always find it inspiring and amazing how uh, the difference of interpretation and what different people get out of reading the same discourse and what I get out of it, reading it at different times. I've read this particular discourse uh, multiple times before, but reading it again, and I had read it before um, we actually came to the meeting, but that night, Monday evening, uh, you can go on discourse, you can go on the Clear Mountain website if you want to learn more about that. But uh, yeah, during the meeting, we were reading it aloud, and I was just struck by um, this uh, pattern which the Buddha uses when he is uh, speaking to people. So in the Pali Canon, uh, which is the um, scriptural text of Theravada Buddhism, which is what the Thai forest takes as our main scriptures, um, people, when you first come to it, if you don't have some kind of karmic affinity or if it's your first time, it seems quite formulaic. Um, you just see these patterns occur again and again, and it just seems, it can seem somewhat robotic uh, or somewhat uh, stilted. Um, partially, that was to help uh, the memorizers. It was an oral tradition before it was written down. Um, when you have these stock phrases, which occur in different discourses, it helps memorizers uh, remember what they're going to say. But what we find in this discourse is a number of these different puzzle pieces, these stock phrases. And there are four of them which occur as ways which the Buddha will address his students. So when the Buddha first um, meets someone, um, you know, it's, if it's whether it's his Buddhist disciples or his lay disciples, he'll, oftenly, he'll often say one thing. And I have loved this line. And it is a stock phrase. Um, but it's quite meaningful and the implications of it are um, quite fascinating. And the course of these four, I realized on Monday, 
have an overlay with a framework which many of us, though perhaps not familiar with the actual details, will at least be familiar with the name of this uh, psychological tool of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So this is Abraham Maslow. He's a humanist psychologist um, writing in the 30s, 40s, 50s, I believe. Uh, and he had this famous hierarchy of needs. And what I believe these different um, introductory or stock phrases that the Buddha poses in succession to uh, his disciples um, over the period, over the course of a conversation, are sort of a Buddhist hierarchy of needs. So I'll just present those in order. So uh, the first of the Buddhist hierarchy of needs, uh, what he says when he is greeted by his disciples, um, he, they have invited him into their house, as you all just did, and what the Buddha will say, oftentimes, if he's not content just to sit in silence, if silence is not the best thing, is, I hope you're bearing up. Kachi vo kamaniyang. I hope you are keeping going. Kachi yapaniyang. I hope you're having no trouble getting food. Pindakena nakilamata. So I have that memorized in Pali because it's actually when people are learning conversational Pali, which is a thing, that's one of the first things we learn how to do because this is what this is a, a greeting in, in Pali. So the Buddha didn't just jump in when he meets someone on the street. He doesn't just say, life is suffering, uh, here's the Four Noble Truths. He had a, a typical greeting asking about people's welfare. And this is equivalent to perhaps the first two level levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That is the level of physiology and safety. So are you getting enough food? Are you safe? Um, are you physically healthy? The first word is kachi kamaniyang. So kachi, it's, it's a question, but it's also a hope. So the Buddha would ask, kachi, are you? Are you bearing up? Or I hope you're bearing up. Kamaniyang, it's related to this word kanti, which some of you will know, which is patience or endurance or tolerance. Is life tolerable for you? Is your situation tolerable? Is, that, is everything okay? How, how's it going? Is what the Buddha is asking you. And yeah, hopefully the Buddha which you invited into your house is the absolutely uh, supremely compassionate and loving Buddha, which he is. Someone who's completely uh, mastered the capacity for loving kindness. He comes in, he's filled your entire house. He's overflowing. Your house is now overflowing with loving kindness. Your house is almost gone and there's just loving kindness. You and the Buddha, or even you and the Buddha are both gone and there's just this reverberance of loving kindness. And he asks, how's it going? Are you okay? Are you bearing up? Are, are things tolerable for you? And when he's asking one of his monastic disciples of, of this, you know, in the uh, Corruption Sutta, these are monks who are living in a forest. They might not even have huts. They might be living at the root of root of trees. So, um, yeah, he's not asking, you know, do you have uh, the new couch and do you have, um, yeah, that new LCD 37-inch big screen TV? Do you have uh, the new Ferrari? Um, whatever it is that um, most people talk about is, uh, the things that maybe, yeah, what, 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 would the, what does it really mean to you and to the Buddha? And when you ask yourself, honestly, what, what does it really mean? How, how much, what, am, am I meeting this, this base level, these first two levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this first question of the Buddha, how is it going? Are you okay? The second question, kachi yapaniyang, the root of this word is ya, like uh, yanas, so a vehicle, the Mahayana is the great vehicle. Yana is that which goes. Yap, uh, yapaniyang. How is it going? It literally means to go. How is it going? Are you, is everything going all right? Is everything going all right for you? And imagine that just coming from the most compassionate and loving source in the universe. <laughs> A completely egoless and boundless um, 
boundless and caring, someone who only wants your welfare and benefit and who does not seek anything for himself. Um, yeah, are you okay? And you can answer. He's, uh, it's open. It's not just uh, like the English, um, yeah, perfunctory. Yeah, how's it going? Which is not really a question. And it's not even a statement. It's almost a, you know, a, a hand's distance. Stay away. Okay, how's it going? And then you're, you're, you don't even stop. But it's, how's it going? I hope you're bearing up. Are you bearing up? Are you able to keep going? And the last question is, are you having enough food? And this is this points to the level of, yeah, um, if you don't have enough food, then you can't take in the Dhamma. Um, there's a incident uh, that's recorded in the Dhammapada commentary to the Dhammapada verse number 203, which is Jigga Cha Parama Roga Sankara Parama Dukkha, which is uh, Jigga Cha, or hunger, is the ultimate disease, the ultimate suffering. And sankharas or formations are the ultimate um, suffering. Having known this, one attains nibbana. So hunger is the ultimate disease, the ultimate um, malady. And the origin story for that is that there was a peasant who the Buddha discerned was uh, able to, he had the requisite spiritual conditions to attain enlightenment. So he actually travels to meet this peasant. And that morning, uh, the peasant's ox had wandered into the forest and he hadn't eaten for a couple days, both the ox and the person. And um, he comes to meet the Buddha and he hadn't eaten all morning. And the Buddha actually first asks him, have you had enough to eat? And uh, the peasant says, no, I haven't. And he said, the Buddha says, okay, get this person some food. And then that person having eaten, the Buddha then teaches him. And the Buddha goes on to say in that verse that someone cannot pick up the Dhamma if they don't have enough to eat. And you can see this, and we actually have seen this recently. Um, yeah, uh, on a recent Saturday, there was a, a person who came to um, yeah, the gathering and uh, showed up, and it was raining, and they were cold, and didn't have a place to sleep, and this was after the gathering, and um, yeah, Ajahn Nisibo actually ended up speaking with them for over an hour, trying to find them a place to stay. We got them um, some food. John gave them um, some uh, some soy milk, and a few others shared um, shared some food. And yeah, it's not like Ajahn Nisibo or myself jumped in and tried to teach this person. Um, this is dependent origination. They were cold, and they didn't. Uh, have enough food, so trying to get them some level of uh, physical uh, physical safety, and eventually, um, that in that particular case didn't go so well. They ended up uh, getting somewhat triggered and um, yeah, leaving and off into the rain. Um, but yeah, we can try what we can, and certainly with ourselves, do we have enough? Are we bearing up? Are things tolerable? Is our situation tolerable? Are we physically healthy enough and do we have enough food? So that's the first level on the Buddhist hierarchy of needs. The next level, so um, if the monastics or the people who um, the Buddha is asking say, yes, we are, we're getting up, we're, we're, we have enough alms food, etc., then the Buddha would then continue, ask the next question, which is, okay, that's great. Uh, I hope you're living in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling, blending like milk and water and regarding each other with kindly eyes. This is a stock phrase which he used again and again. And this is equivalent perhaps to the next couple layers, layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is this need for love, need for um, community, need for uh, support and some level of esteem. Um, so, um, yeah, and this is a, a beautiful statement and all of the monks in this story, in the Corruptions Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 128, uh, say that, yes, we are. Uh, we are dwelling in harmony, appreciating each other, um, not quarreling, blending like milk and water. What a beautiful simile. Before I came to the suttas, I never thought about what it would be like to mix milk and water, but yeah, they mix pretty well together. But, you know, they don't 
stay forever. If you add too much water, then eventually the milk proteins are going to settle to the bottom. You have to, um, yeah, you have to continually keep an eye on this. It's not the, the case that, um, yeah, any substance will stay blended uh, forever. So that might be not totally sure about the chemical accuracy of that statement. But milk and water, have too much water, some of the milk stuff is going to settle over time. Um, I was thinking this morning, Ajahn Nisibo and I, we get along really well. I'm so grateful for Ajahn Nisibo. And, um, but he and I are more like milk and coffee. So he's the coffee and I'm the, the soy milk. So um, we blend well together. Um, so, but can you do this? Um, can you blend well and view each other with kindly eyes? This is really important in a communal setting. So, um, yeah, this is important. So, uh, asking this uh, other aspect of, pra of practice, how are my relationships right now? Even if I'm okay, how are my relationships with the people who really matter in my life? And hopefully you have some level of, um, yeah, hopefully there's a level of uh, security there, a the level of love. And if not, do what you can. And if you can't do anything more than that, there's still something missing, then yeah, you just have to be okay. You have to cunty. You have to endure with what you can't control. Um, something else which the monks say here, um, which is not quoted here, but this is their, their response to this next question, is that uh, it seems that though we're multiple in body, we're one in mind. We're one in mind. And that's just fascinating to uh, bring to mind. And you can bring it to mind both when you're with other people. That is an incredibly helpful and useful and beautiful, skillful means. When you're with other people, drop that seed, that little drop of almond or soy milk into the, the water of your social environment. Say, yeah, we're one in body, but you know, on one level, we're, we're, we're multiple in body, excuse me. But on one level, can we be one in mind? That seed perception, just drop that, uh, that beautiful perception into your social environment. And yeah, there's a truth to it. And even when you're by yourself, when you're thinking of other people, when you're practicing metta, we're multiple in body, but we can be one in mind. And <laughs> uh, didn't um, so that's the second level of this Buddhist hierarchy of needs: the social level, the love needs. We need to have some level of communal harmony. And on again, how much do you really need? And in a Buddhist context, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is somewhat uh, controversial because there was at least uh, some uh, idea that you have to have the lower before you can actually uh, attain these higher levels of uh, well-being. Um, but in a Buddhist context, um, yeah, experimenting with, okay, how much do I, how much you know food and security do I really need? You know, the monks who he was talking to eat only one meal a day, and certainly uh, many of the monastics I uh, respect today. Um, only eat one meal a day, and all of the monastics I eat, uh, I, <laughs> I am friends with today, only eat before noon, and many lay people do that as well. So, what are the limits of that? How much do we really need um, to be able to to thrive and to flourish? Um, and similarly with um, communal harmony, how much communal input do I really need? In the Buddhist time, we have to get together every two weeks to recite the Padimokkha, um, our monks' rules. And we actually recite part of this phrase, this stock phrase, at the end of our Padimokkha. It's, we say, uh, we all train together, living in harmony, appreciating each other without quarreling. Thus, the Padimokkha is finished. So we chant this, the exact same words, uh, every two weeks, and that's what we're training for. Um, so it's a, a ceremony, just like we did in the five precepts earlier today. So the next level of the Buddhist hierarchy of needs is diligence. So the next question, if the um, his interlocutors, the people who uh, the Buddha is talking to, say that yes, they are um, yeah, living 
well socially, he would ask, um, but I hope you're living diligently, keen and resolute. So another translation is, I hope you're dwelling, dwelling diligent, ardent and resolute. So um, yeah, once you've got your food and your physicality, your safety, and once you've got communal harmony, how are you practicing? How are you practicing? This is equivalent to the level of, um, say a level of self transcendence on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There are a couple of intermediate phases in Maslow's hierarchy, such as needs for um, needs for cognitive well-being or needs for uh, aesthetic or artistic well-being, and those are actually touched on. The monks here in this sutta say that, yes, they're doing well. How are they doing well? Um, they are uh, living well together and they're keeping the monastery clean. They're keeping it orderly. Um, they get together and have their meal together, but then they put everything away. So it's a, a beautiful environment. There's not trash all over the place. Uh, so there's a level of beauty and they usually don't talk. They're usually keeping noble silence. So that's another um, input for how much social, um, social socializing we need. Um, but then once every five days, and this is what we would do at Ajahn Jaya Saros, um, the monks living near him, and when Ajahn Nesibo and I lived near him in Thailand, every we wouldn't we would just be living in our own huts, going on our own alms rounds, by ourselves, living by ourselves every day. But once every five days, we would get together and have dhamma talk all night. Well. With Ajahn Jayasara, we would just do it for a couple of hours. Um, but here in this sutta, uh, the Upakilesa Sutta um, on corruptions, they would talk all night. They'd talk Dhamma all night. So that's cognitive needs in the Maslow's hierarchy. Or self-transcendence. Um, or in a Buddhist context, are we practicing? And this is really important, especially for monastics. Uh, Ajahn Nisabo wrote a beautiful poem recently um, which you can find on Shravasti Abbey's website, um, which has a, a line in the middle of it, which says, I did not ordain to live in a warm hut. And yeah, okay, I'm getting enough food. I've got this level of safety. Um, and, you know, I get along with my fellow monks. But that's not the end of the story. Am I dwelling diligent, ardent, and resolute? And as a practitioner, especially you know, this upper middle way Buddhism, um, you know, the upper middle class, that's the, that's the funny, funnyism, um, upper middle way Buddhism. Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> it can be good to test, um, yeah, how much are you really on the edge of your practice? Um, are you really challenging yourselves? Is there not maybe a higher order of well-being that you can attain? How much are you practicing? You've got, um, yeah, you've got your warm house, you've got food, but how much are you practicing? Are you practicing the degree? Are you practicing the amount that feels right and, uh, and is helpful for your life trajectory and for the present moment? And the final level of the Buddhist uh, hierarchy of needs is attainment. So you've got food, you've got safety, you've got uh, communal harmony, and you're practicing, but the Buddha doesn't just stop there. He says, but as you live diligently like this, have you achieved any superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, a meditation at ease? So for people who are interested in the chanting books, there's a, a verse called the 10 subjects for frequent recollection. You can look at it at some point. This is something that uh, we are suggested as monastics to ask ourselves all the time. Has my practice borne fruit with freedom or insight so that at the end of my life, I need not feel ashamed when questioned by my spiritual companions? Um, yeah, so it's the exact same words as here. Has my life, has my practice borne fruit with freedom or insight? Have I attained a superior human distinction? So yeah, <laughs> there are these levels of attainment in Theravada Buddhism and in Mahayana Buddhism. Um, so it's great to be in the present moment. That is the working ground. And eventually we stay here, keep staying here every moment. And eventually um, the path will open up. The continental shelf will drop off. We'll reach true depth in our practice. 
in this, um, Maslow's hierarchy originally, it ended um, at self, I'm sorry, it was self-actualization was the, the top level. But then he says, actually, you can transcend the self. So there's this level of transcendence. And the Buddha, <laughs> also to these same monks that he was talking to um, in this discourse, he um, is speaking to in a different discourse, the, I think it's the Chula Gosinga Sutta Majjhima number th 31, he asked the same monks these same four levels of questions to asking about the Buddhist hierarchy of needs. And then here he asks, they say, yes, we've got the first jhana. And he says, that's great, sadhu, sadhu. He says, sadhu, sadhu, like we do. But then he says, what about the second jhana? And they say, yeah, we can do that. And he says, that's great, sadhu, sadhu. What about the third jhana? And they say, yes, sadhu, sadhu. What about the fourth jhana, etc. into the immaterial attainments, into enlightenment? And they say, yes. And then he says, great, you've done the job. You've reached this meditation at ease. So um, that's that's the culmination. So that's full transcendence. And I think that really goes way beyond the, uh, totally transcends any kind of pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so yeah, let's uh, look at these in our own lives and uh, in the formal talk there. Antamayang Tamakataya Satu Pakarang Katamase Satu 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 Anumotani. Yeah, isn't it that great that the Buddha said Sadhu 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 himself? Or he usually said it twice for some reason, but um you can keep doing it three times because that's what we usually do. But yeah, let's open things up to uh, questions. Let me, let me, let me um, so people um, who have any questions, you can raise your hand um, there. And then people who have questions in person at St. Mark's, you can uh, raise your hand and hopefully we'll have a mic runner come to you as well. Maybe Cheryl, are you back? Would you um, be able to... MC or call on people? Sure, I can call on people. Thanks. Matthew sure. has his hand raised um, in the room. Okay, Matthew, please. Okay. Make sure people can unmute. Oh yeah, hello. Uh, first of all, Namo Buddha, everyone. And uh, I really wanted to congratulate everybody with uh, the new year. And uh, because I couldn't really attain the uh, vigil, yeah, I decided to do it today and say uh, that, yeah, happy new year, everybody. And I also wanted to wish uh, to get better as soon as possible to everybody who got COVID, because I read that some people got COVID, especially you, Ajans, and please stay safe, right? And uh, the question which I also wanted to ask, right, when you were uh, discussing the suttas, is that uh, you said like uh, that all of them are getting into some pot patterns which are um, kind of like easy to memorize. But uh, I think it's really, really interesting that not only Buddha is uh, speaking in patterns, but also people who I guess in like they their day to day life wouldn't be speaking in patterns. So it's like kind of like when you meet the actual Buddha, it's kind of influencing you in some way that you also start to kind of like getting into those. But because I genuinely believe Buddha really like everything which is written in Pali Canon wasn't really like structured that way because like Buddha as the supreme being would be able to uh, kind of like get those patterns. So yeah, I don't see any strange in that. But is it like influencing people to such a degree that they also start to, to do this? And sad, sad, sad. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, Happy New Year to you as well. Um, yeah, I think you bring up a good point and an interesting point. Um, I imagine uh, some people, when they read the formulaic nature of what the Buddha said, uh, it, just, it just seems not alive enough. The Buddha would be more spontaneous. Um, and I think that's definitely true. But I think there, there were times when he would speak in formulas. If people have ever listened to Bhante Analio's uh, guided meditations, he too speaks in, in formulas. He got, does guided meditations uh, in formulas. And when 
I can certainly imagine the Buddha having stock phrases um, where he would, you know, present the Four Noble Truths or the Four Foundations of Mindfulness or the Four Right Efforts in using the same words. You know, you, you know every, or may, probably not, almost certainly not every time uh, or definitely not every time. But I think there's definitely uh, use both for being completely spontaneous, which the Buddha could do perfectly, and using patterns and using, um, yeah, pre-formulated um, structures. So the Buddha could do that perfectly well and, and did as well. The whole Anguttara Nikaya is uh, somewhat of a testament to that. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, I, I don't think that totally answered your question. Maybe you could write your question um, if I didn't fully answer it in the, the chat and I can try to respond to that better. Um, yeah. We have uh, if, oh, Sorry, if you weren't finished. Oh, no, I was finished. I just wanted to say that I'm still on mute. So is it reply it implies that I can uh, say that uh, my main question was that like regular people per se me, if I met Buddha uh, and in real life, like not in a guided meditation, but in real life, would it be such a thing that I am so influenced or, or anybody really influenced that we also start to speak like not in specific patterns as Buddha, like obviously new Sanskrit and Brahmin stuff, right? But I mean, like on some natural level. So it influences me inside that I ne do not necessarily know all of the Vedas and everything, but I just start to do it. Like, and then it really like, why is it rhymes like regular people, regular folk? Why is it rhyming so well, right? Because Buddha, yeah, supreme being, obviously could do everything. Normal people. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good question, and everybody probably is imagining differently, and it's it's hard to say. I can certainly imagine that um, I have had this experience when I've been near teachers who I I do believe I've met enlightened teachers, and when I'm near them, my heart. I get 20 feet away from them, I've had experiences, and then my heart just settles very unexpectedly, very strangely, and I start thinking much more clearly. So I wouldn't be surprised if, um, yeah, if the Buddha was right in front of me, if I was able, you know, if I was just able to speak more clearly than I have in my adult life, um, and would I be speaking in patterns? Would I, um, I don't know, but I think that the Buddha would uh, speak directly to me and that was one of his skills. He would speak exactly to what you would need. Um, that was one of his uh, particular gifts as a Buddha. So maybe. So, so this is Cheryl, did you have? Uh, Sid, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Sid. I'm pretty new to the Buddhism. I'm, I'm, thank you for letting me ask the question. So uh, what I understand is Buddha would not recommend believing anything from face value, actually questioning, right? So I was wondering, like, the practice that uh, we talked about today, the Dharma talk, that uh, if Buddha would meet someone and then ask, like, have you reached fourth jhana or third jhana and all those things? I was wondering, is it a really good practice? Because it seemed like, let's say, if I meet a student and then ask, hey, have you got all your uh, straight A's? Or if I meet an investor, like, hey, did you make a million or something? Or <laughs> uh, did your, all your kids are going to Stanford? Or, all this thing. I think this question might stress people out. Uh, definitely, it might make me feel stressed. Like, hey, did you become a senior, or whatever, engineer, or something? So I was wondering, like, is this some some practice? Are like, how would the monks who have not reached, did yeah. they feel bad? Did they just <laughs> or ultimately, like, we want all being to be at peace and ease, right? Yeah. So if I just go and ask, like, hey, have you uh, reached enlightened enlightened yeah. meant state already right yeah so no. is, it a, is it something something that can make people feel bad if um the intention was is not right so i was wondering like is this a is a uh, something that we can suggest people to actually practice yeah no v you make a very good point thank you sid and i'm glad you came back um glad to hear you and i'm glad you don't have COVID. that's fantastic or you don't sound like it so um yeah no wonderful question and no the buddha he wouldn't always do these four sets of questions. He would basically stop at the level that the person was at, like that Dhammapada story where, yeah, if the person doesn't have enough to eat, they're not physically safe. He wouldn't then go on to say, oh, well, or do you have um, communal safety and 
or your sangha needs met? Uh, do you have kalyana mitta? Um, but he would address the the physical needs, um, and similarly with um, the next level, you know, he wouldn't go past um, the level of uh, yeah. If if they weren't getting getting along well earlier in that discourse, it's actually a beautiful portrait because at the beginning of that sutta, it's like these a bunch of monks behaving badly, um, basically monks gone wild, and uh, these. Well-behaved monks, uh, Anuruddha and his friends at the end of the discourse are the counterexample of these badly behaving monks. Um, so the Buddha didn't, you know, he didn't go further. Okay, they're not getting along, so he's just going to leave. Um, and yeah, in that, in <laughs> the first discourse I mentioned, um, he doesn't go past that first question. Have you reached a, a superior human state? They don't say yes, so he doesn't press further. But in the uh, Chula Gosinga Majima number 31, he does because they keep saying yes. So he keeps pushing them on. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very good point that we need, do need to um, gauge the neuroticism of our effort. Uh, how healthy or unhealthy is our, our effort? Um, I gotta fix my quote here. Um, yeah, because a lot of us Westerners, like you're saying, we just have such unrealistic and idealistic views and of how we should be and how everybody else should be. And we we take that and impose it on ourselves and beat ourselves over the head with it while we're meditating. And um, that's not that's not healthy. We actually need to unlearn that, that skill. So there is um, perhaps the best thing to do is... Uh, yeah, just rest in this uh, third level. I've got enough food. I'm feeling safe. I'm getting along with the people who matter in my life. And I'm practicing right now. I'm practicing right now. And if I start getting heedless, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to watch a YouTube video. Um, and nope, I mean, no diss on, you know, I'm a monk. I've got, I'm not supposed to be going on YouTube. But you're all, you know, you don't have those kind of constraints. But yeah, if you get... Um, yeah, are you are you really on the the cutting edge, or are you on a helpful edge of your practice? So, uh, yeah, just yeah, rest rest exactly where you need to be. Um, I hope that answered your question, Sid. Very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. As and thank you for um, the answer. Just uh, I'll I'll just share my takeaway qu very quickly. So I think the Buddha is not trying to make another person feel bad. Like, oh, you are not enlightened. I don't even want to talk to you. So instead, probably like he's opening the communication channel to see, okay, uh, this is the point. Third jhana, you're stuck. Or maybe in some other 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 state, you're stuck. And then maybe opening a channel, kind of like uh, helping them to guide through, like, you know, this is the way you can get around. Maybe just to opening a communication channel so that he can help. Exactly. Properly. Exactly. Okay. These are all phrased as, I hope you are. This kachi, K-A-C-C-I, is the Pali word. And it's both a hope and a question. And he literally, <laughs> the Buddha was not only, I mean, arguably one of the best, you know, speakers ever, period. But he was also probably one of the best, if not the best listener ever. At least that's my biased Buddhist uh, opinion. But um, he would totally hear what everybody's answers were to his genuine and deep and useful questions. Um, and in this sutta, he does indeed, they, they don't say that they've attained. And then so he gives them guidance on how exactly to do that, how to get rid of the hindrances to meditation. So thank you, Sid. Great thank point. you, Ajahn. And uh, now we can go to Mary on Zoom. Ajahn, hello, friends. Um, I just loved how friendly the Buddha was. Uh, that he would just come in and be so kind of human. How are you doing? Do you have enough food? I just, the kindness of him really came through in those questions. And I, I have a rather odd question for you, Ajahn. When the Buddha was in my home, and that was a beautiful meditation to imagine that, when he left, there was this beautiful fragrance in the home. And I'm wondering, is there anything in the suttas about the fragrance of the Buddha? Yeah, yeah, such a beautiful yeah, question. Yeah. 
So, yeah. yeah, there is, there is. And uh, thank you for, that wasn't a part of my um, imagination, my Buddha Sati this morning, but it will be going forward. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Dhammapada, the f- fourth chapter of the Dhammapada is all about flowers. Flower is the main metaphor. And there's uh-huh. all sorts of uh, metaphors about how anyone virtuous has a, um, a fragrance which never leaves and goes against the wind. But it's also called the Buddha, the place where the Buddha lived at Jetavana is called the Ganda Kuti. The Kuti is the hut and the Ganda is the, the fragrance. So the, the hut of fragrance. And that's not because he lit a bunch of incense or had Nag Champa going all the time. But uh, that's, I'm, that's fascinating that that came up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. And it looks like we have Edmund online next. Yeah, and maybe that... Um, Everybody this, in the room, I'm not sure. Yeah, can John. we do, should we do so one we or John, two? John in the room, and then maybe Edmund. Okay. okay, okay, great. And those may be the two last questions. Hi, John. I had a question about AM 7.71, Bawana Sutta committed to development. Uh, the Buddha talks about the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four right efforts, the four bases of psychic power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven awakening, awakening factors, and the Noble Eightfold Path. I was just wondering what are the four kinds of mindfulness meditation and maybe the four right efforts if there's time or if there's not, just yeah. whatever you want to answer. Yeah, I'll just, um, there's a book, Wings to Awakening by uh, Tanisa Robiku, Ajahn Jeff which goes into this list of what are called the 37 wings to awakening, Bodhi, Paki, Adama, um, and the four uh, mindfulness ones that you are mentioning is the Satipatthana, so the four foundations of mindfulness, knowing the body, feeling, mind, Dhammas in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Um, so those are the four uh, foundations of mindfulness, and the four... Uh, Right? Efforts are abandoning those unwholesome st- uh, or um, preventing unarisen, unwholesome states from arising. One, uh, abandoning unwholesome states that have arisen, arousing wholesome states that haven't yet arisen, and developing and cultivating and uh, bringing to completion those wholesome states which have arisen. And yeah, that wings to awakening goes into that in extreme detail. Thank you, Ajahn. And then Edmund is the last. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello, I have a question here about um, chanting and um, these um, foreign language um, um, words or text that I don't really understand, and I'm not sure if other people understand. Because in my mind, uh, it has to be kind of clear what what people are talking about here. So when I hear, like, uh, is it Pali or some kind of other language that I don't know words or terminology? Hmm. So I was wondering if there's a way to uh, do it in English and uh, so that it will be clear what is what and what we're talking about. Uh, and maybe in, in the brackets to have, uh, you know, Pali or some other language that you're using there or vice versa, you know, have Pali and then explain in English yes. clearly what it means, what it stands for. So yes, that was my question. And Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Edmund. And good to see you again, or at least uh, hear you. Um, yeah, um, you bring up a good point. Many people, uh, don't, I mean, nobody really probably who's here knows Pali. Um, and so it's unfamiliar to most people. Um, and some people just don't have any affinity with it, no interest in it. And, um, it just seems foreign and English translation is, is good enough. And for other people, it's deeply meaningful. I mean, uh, The Buddha probably did speak something, if not Pali, exactly something close to Pali. And so there's this resonance. It's like when you're chanting Pali, it's almost like you're in the presence of the Buddha again. Uh, So we do a little bit of both. So if you 
uh, there should be a link in the Zoom, uh, yeah, in Zoom and um, on YouTube to the Amaravati chanting book. Yeah, Cheryl just put that up. Um, and you can go there, and that's got English and Pali for everything that we've uh, chanted today. And yeah, thanks for that input. I, I love me some Pali, so I'm apt to try to use more Pali than people are comfortable with, but so please, please excuse my Pali amory. Um, so yeah, we have to um, uh, close up. <laughs>